As we journey on through the book of Acts, we are going to have some Sundays where we have large chunks of Scripture. And uh, I, for one, do not accept the, the, uh, the whole idea of limited attention spans and that people can't pay attention for more than five seconds and everything else. So, uh, you know, the church has been text messaging for 2,000 years. So just imagine that this is a long text message that you're receiving and you can stay with it, right? If it was on your phone, you'd be excited about it. So uh, it, what I'm going to read, in many ways, Acts chapter 3 is an example of exactly what Jesus told the 12 apostles that they would do in Luke chapter 9 that Doreen read for us. Recall Jesus gave them power and authority to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal, and he told them to take no money, not even an extra tunic. We are also told last week in the scripture that Pastor David preached on, that in Acts 2, verse 43, it said, Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. And Acts chapter 3 then gives us the first specific example of that that we hear. So listen to Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask alms, ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico, called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is, Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. 
and all the prophets, as many as have spoken from Samuel and those after him, also predicted these days. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Whew. Part of what I try to do in sermons, sometimes straight out telling you and other times by just example and doing it, but part of what I hope to do is to help you to get more out of your own Bible reading and study. So here's another tip. When you're reading a passage that has more than one character in it, you want to think and imagine that passage through the eyes or through the perspective of all the different characters in the passage. And we want to guard against, when we read the Bible, too frequently associating ourselves with the strong, positive, or most admirable people in the story, as though, of course, that's always us and what I would do. And at the same time, we have to be open to the idea that we might have something in common. We may have something in common with, we may have something to learn from those who may be weak or less admirable or even portrayed negatively, rather than thinking, well, that would never be me. I'd never do that. So, keeping that in mind, Acts chapter 3 is a good chapter to look at through the lenses of the different characters who are present. Most especially, Peter and John, the man who is born lame, that's what I'm going to primarily focus on, and then just really, really briefly, the people who are a part of the passage. So let's start by just looking at this through the lenses of Peter and John. Remember that this is the first scene in the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost in chapter 2. And Luke has told us so far in Acts that the church was formed by the gift and the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's formed by responding in repentance and baptism. And it's gathered around four things that we heard last week. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. So that's how the church is organized. And then chapter 3, what are Peter and John going to do? They're going to pray. Like the good and devout Jews that they are, they're going up to the temple to pray. And the temple represents the very heart of national religious life for the Jewish people. And on their way in, they're confronted by this man who has been lame from birth. Now, in your little Bible memory up there, you go sorting through your files, and when you hear that, you think, oh, didn't the disciples and Jesus go by somebody else who had a physical condition from birth that was a problem? Bing, 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 that's right, John chapter 9. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And one of the many times Jesus goes, neither of them sinned. That's not why this happened. And then you go through that whole great chapter of the man's healing and coming to faith in Christ. So what happens here? The exact same process, right? And if you look in your Bible at Acts chapter 3 and verses 1 through 10, it's the exact same form of the healing stories in the Gospels. Exact same form. The ill person and the healer meet. There's a description of the ill person's condition that makes healing, healing seem difficult or impossible. Right? Lame from birth. He didn't just roll his ankle going up to the temple the previous week. Lame from birth. Seems difficult, if not impossible. There is a healing action. Peter says, look at us. Takes his hand, lifts him up. There's a healing action, and words are described. The healing occurs. Proof of the healing is demonstrated. The guy's jumping up and down and leaping. Pretty good. And then the witnesses are described as being amazed. This is the pattern for healing that we see in the ministry of Jesus and we see now in the early church. And part of what Luke is trying to do is to show the continuity between the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the church. Because through the Spirit, Peter and John are used to do the exact same thing they saw Jesus do. 
So this story encourages us to see the work in which the church is engaged now as continuing the work of Jesus and the apostles. And part of that work is for all of us who are disciples to be aware of what we have to give, what we have to share with, to bless, and to help others. We may not have the gifts of an apostle. Most of us don't have the gifts of an apostle. And those gifts, according to 2 Corinthians 12, 12, are signs and wonders and mighty works. I can't even clean my office. Trust me, I don't have the gifts of an apostle, all right? But we all have something. We all have something we can give. And Peter and John look right at the guy. Hey, I don't have any money. The guy's sitting there with his hand out, sitting there with a rug for people to throw coins on. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have, I give you. Can we say that to people? What I have, I give you. That's what we see when we see this story through the eyes of the apostles. Because we all have gifts, abilities, resources, experience, energy, time that we can give and share in Jesus' name. And we want to share them freely and willingly, just like Peter and John. Because when we do, friends, guess what? God will transform lives. And that's good news. Not a single amen out of all of that. Okay, thank you. I got all morning. You know, the pancakes will be there. Let's step away from Peter and John for a second and look at this experience through the eyes of the lame man who was begging. In biblical times, the beggar represents one of the lowest have-nots in society. A man unable to work, reduced to begging as his only hope for sustenance, was pitiable in the fullest sense of the word, and lame from birth, having to be carried daily by other people and placed at the gate. I mean, can you imagine the man's sense of worth, dignity? How do you have that? when you're in this position. He's been needy all his life, and he begs from those entering the temple. Now think for a moment about the contrast between this beggar and the temple that he is sitting in front of. The beggar has nothing. He's the poorest of the poor, and he's next to this incredibly opulent building that exudes wealth. Herod built the second temple. It was only a 46-year process. That's even longer than Ben working on his house. (laughs) So it's a 46-year process. And it's built with uh, lavishly gold-decorated roofs, bright white marble columns. Uh, According to the Jewish historian Josephus, the stones used in the construction of the second temple were so white that from a distance it resembled a mountain of snow. And the sun's reflection there in the Middle East from the extensive gilding made it painful, actually, for onlooker in a bright sunny day to look at the building. You couldn't even look at it straight on. And the temple contained both the spoils of war and the voluntary offerings of believers. But the temple also represented exclusion because the lame and the blind were prevented from entering the inner courts of the temple. Think about the song that we began this service with, right? Better is one day in your courts right, than thousands elsewhere. Nowhere I'd rather be. Can you imagine someone saying, oh, but you You can't be in there. How would you feel? How would you feel if we had someone at the door of the church who said, no, you, because of your condition, you can't come in here. Some people look back at 2 Samuel 5, verses 6 to 8 for the rationale or the basis for this long-standing discrimination against the physically impaired. But also excluded were Gentiles, 
Jewish women were only given restricted access. And so then you think about how ironic is it that a gate called beautiful performed the ugly task of excluding people from access to the place that housed the very presence of God. He was excluded from the temple. And all that it symbolized in Israel, divine presence, prayer, sacrifice, and atonement for sin, all because of the way he was born. The lame man, you have to give him credit though, is a wise businessman. He knows where to be positioned, right at that gate outside the temple, to have the best chance of receiving alms. But... He's not there as part of the worshiping community, but as someone seeking charity from that community of which he cannot be a part. And that's why it's so significant after he is healed, not only does his physical ability change, but his location changes. It says in verse verse 8, right, he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Can you imagine how you would feel being able to enter the place of worship with the community for the very first time and being physically healed? And the healing moves the man from outside the temple to inside it, from someone not able to participate in the worshiping community to being a part of it. So in other words, hidden inside this healing story is the message that to be included in the worshiping community is itself to experience a form of healing. That lame man being healed signals a new era in which one's condition, which Luke, who also wrote Acts, as I'll keep reminding you, described in his gospel as Jesus came for the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Luke was telling us in his gospel that Jesus came for people who were being excluded from the worshiping community. And now this newly healed man can enter the temple restored physically and socially, and it's a glimpse into the new reality of the new kingdom of God that's being ushered in by the resurrected Christ. Some of us may identify with this healed man. I mean, I suspect more of us identified with the healed man than we do with the apostles because most of us have not been used to bring about miraculous healing in the lives of other people, but many of us have experienced physical or other challenges that often seem difficult or insurmountable. Some of us have experienced feeling left outside of a group, outside the walls of a community. And the story invites us to see ourselves as individuals who have experienced and are experiencing healing by our inclusion in the church. You know, we often think of joining the church like a consumer choosing a restaurant or a, you know, it's a store at which to shop. But this encounter between Peter, the rock of the church, is a reminder that God has also taken us by the hand. God wants to, us to get up and to stand up and to escort us into the worshiping community. It's a reminder for us to celebrate that we are included in the body of Christ by grace instead of by our own will or our own worthiness. Peter's words to the lame man were life-altering. He's learned to live in the marginal areas of society that are offered to lesser people, and his life totally consisted of appealing to the conscience of others in hopes of a generous response. It's hard for, I think, most of us to imagine what it's like to beg. Who knows how many times he heard no before receiving the yes of a few coins on his mat. Who knows how many people walked by him without bothering to see him. To see him. It's so significant that Peter and John looked intently at him and asked him to look 
at them. What a difference it makes when we look people in the eye. When we acknowledge our common humanity and we see someone as an individual with whom we share a common need for God. And the good news of the kingdom is the distribution of God's healing and salvation is to all. And Peter spoke under the authority of Jesus Christ and said, get up, stand up, and change your perspective. You are welcome in the house of God. Now if we imagine ourselves in the place of Peter and John, we may see that we are being asked to play a similar role in offering healing to others by including them in the community of faith. And the inclusion of outsiders stands in continuity with the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles. We need to ask ourselves, who are those who are sitting near our gates? Who's sitting on the edges of our church or the edges of our society who can find healing in being seen with the full worth and personhood by the church? It's very important to note that Peter did not require the lame man to believe in Christ to offer him healing. Did you notice that? It's Peter's belief in the power of the name of Jesus Christ That's what affects the healing. The man didn't have any faith at all. He didn't even know who these guys were. And in the same way today, the church need not reach out only to those who believe and act and look like us. The church calls, this passage calls churches as well as individual Christians to reach out to the stranger, to the other, whoever that other may be. And we see in this text that in the book of Acts, the gift of inclusion in the worshiping community is as old as the church itself. We're moved by this encounter between Peter and John and the beggar to ask ourselves several questions. Who do we as a congregation need to look at intently and see? Who needs to look at our church more closely? Do we believe, as Peter and John did, that the Gospel message includes physical and social healing and restoration? How might our congregation help to restore someone socially, like an ex-offender or an immigrant or a person who happens to be homeless or any other host of types of people? Very briefly, I want to note there's a third person or third group in this passage. There's Peter and John. There's the man, and then there's the people. That's y'all people. And the people, and their response, they see the man, they recognize him, they're filled with wonder, amazement, they're utterly astonished, they're stupefied. And that leads to yet another sermon by Peter, Bob, here it comes. Second sermon already from Peter in two chapters. There's going to be more as the book goes on, so I'm not going to draw that all out. But a couple quick notes about that sermon. In Peter's sermon to the people, he deflects all the credit for the healing of the man. So why do you look at us as if it's our power or our piety? It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do about the name of Jesus. That's why this guy's healed, and that's why you see him walking about like this. His whole sermon's about Jesus. There's also something else very interesting to me in his sermon. That uh, when I shared it with some people this week, someone asked, how come I've never heard this before? But you see, in Luke and in Acts, there is no notion that Jesus had to die to fulfill some divine requirement for justice or to satisfy the wrath of God. What's known in theological terms as substitutional atonement. We find that in Paul. We find that in many of the contemporary Christian songs that we sing at this service. But the explanation for Jesus' death in Acts is straightforwardly human sin. 
human violence, human evil. And Peter says, you can look it up so you don't think I'm making it up, Peter says to the people, look at the phrases, you handed over and rejected. You rejected. You killed. It's the people's sin. And in Acts, the cross is the sign of the rejection of God's anointed by the very people he came to save. That's why it's so tragic. The very people he came to save. Kill him. And yet, and this is the good news, God has overcome that human sinful no in the powerful yes of the resurrection. I want to close. Just got to skip that part. I want to close by saying Acts chapter 3 contains the good news that God can and still does graciously heal and restore lives. It's a passage about personal and social restoration that happens in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. It's about hearing a call to us to get up and to stand up and to walk. It's about being unashamed to be boldly leaping and praising God. It's about inclusion and helping to change people's physical and social location from outside of the community of faith to full participants in the worshiping community. And our task is to believe the message that Peter preached about Jesus and, as he said, to repent, therefore, to turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Isn't that a great phrase? Times of refreshing. Anyone need to be refreshed with everything that's going on in your life or in the world today? Refreshing is good, isn't it? Our task is to help make that happen for other people as well. In your bulletin, you're going to see two, you've already seen two things. This little blue insert. And kind of in line with the scriptures, I want you to see yourself like Peter and John. And we're just asking you, you know, what I have, I give you. We all have different ways we can give, we can share, we can serve. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, the people in the media booth are, are waving signs at me saying, how come the media booth isn't on this list as well? All right? But we just want to encourage you. Hey, what have you to give that you might be able to share? And if you, already, if you want to fill this out and write down all the ways you already are, that's great. Uh, if you want to fill this out this morning and throw it in the offering plate, bring it by the information booth, that's great. If you want to send it in, bring it next week. But we just ask you to prayerfully reflect on how can you help us to help others. The other thing you'll see is the Invite a Friend Sunday card. Uh, and this is just, we want to give you a chance to have something tangible. Sometimes when you want to invite somebody to church, it helps to have something you can give them and say, hey, we're doing this special thing this Sunday. I'd love to have you come with us. And uh, again, don't invite somebody who goes to another church already. You know, it's... You know, I don't want calls from other pastors. Why are you doing this? You know, the idea is to invite someone who's not connected to a faith community and to invite them to join us for what should be a fun and a special Sunday. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, your followers, Peter and John, gave to one of your children something more powerful, something more valuable than riches. They gave healing and they gave hope. And we ask that you would bring healing and hope into our world and into our lives and show us evidence of your presence that is undeniable. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.